Good morning. And it is good to be in the house of the Lord, able to sing praises, able to go to the Lord in prayer, good to open up the Word of God. And we'll do that in just a moment. But first, I want to talk a little, um, a little basketball. Uh, me and the kids, we play, and I like to talk a little smack talk uh, with the kiddos when we play a little basketball or a little game. Last night, we played a little card game, and I was kind of getting mouthy, right? When we were, I was winning. It's funny because I, I generally always start out winning. Like we go out and we'll play hoops and I'll score the first two, four points and uh, feeling pretty good about myself. And I always tell them the same thing. I say, you know what? Oh, dad's up four to nothing. Said, uh, I always tell them, I say, in order for you guys to win, to beat me, you're going to have to come from behind to do it. Right? And so I try to put the pressure on them, but it never works because uh, always they end up beating me anyway, and usually pretty bad. But every once in a while, hey, it's good to start off. And so I'll remind them if I jump out to you know, an early two to nothing lead, hey, you guys are going to have to come back if you're going to beat me, but they always do. But seriously, uh, ask you a question, uh, really an important question. Would you rather be winning in the first quarter, in the first part of the game? Would you rather be winning in the first part of the game, or would you rather be winning at the end of the game? Right? Right? End of the game. Everybody, everybody wants to win at the end of the game. We're going to look at a passage today um, that I think demonstrates that theme. Um, we would rather win at the end of the game. When it's all said and done, that's where we want to win. And so we're going to be looking at a guy who seemed to be winning in the first quarter. Seemed like he had everything going for him. Seemed to have everything working in his favor, and it just seemed that, that he was winning in the first part of his life. And to kind of mix up the metaphor just a little bit, this guy is almost like this guy was born on third base. Right? He's born on third base, but he's having trouble finding his way home. He's, he's missing something, not sure what he's missing, but he's missing something in his life. We're going to continue in the Gospel of Mark. Um, we're going to be in Mark chapter 10. We've been in the Gospel of Mark for a month, and we've been looking at how Mark's been teaching us uh, what's important, the things that are of value, things that are really important that we need to be locked down on as we live out our Christian life. And a few weeks ago, we talked about faith, how faith is important. Faith is a lot more important than fear, right? We, we live by faith not just by sight and what's going around us, and so faith is important. And then we talked about purpose. Purpose is far better than popularity. God has given you a purpose, and, and, and He's given you gifts and, and, and resources and tools to use. You, you have a mission, and so purpose. And then last week we talked about that faith family, how important it is to be a part of church family, spiritual family, Today we're going to look at spiritual treasure, Mark chapter 10. And so this guy is coming. Seems like he has it all together. Seems like he'd have everything that he could possibly want, but he comes to Jesus really, I think, in desperation mode. He understands that he's missing something. He just don't know what it is. Mark chapter 10, we'll begin at verse 17. And remember, love Mark's gospel because it's just one thing right after another. People are flocking to Jesus. He's turning the whole town upside down. People can't get enough of his teaching and his preaching, and everybody's hanging on his word, and everybody's wanting to ask Jesus something, and they're just crowds of people just pressing against him. And things happen immediately. And so this guy comes up to Jesus, verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him, fell down on his knees before Jesus, and says, Good teacher... What must I do to inherit eternal life? Okay, What do I got to do to get to heaven? And Jesus answered, Why do you call me good? No one's good except God alone. 
And he said, you know the commandments. You shall not murder, commit adultery, don't do that, don't steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and your mother. And this guy responds, he says, teacher, all these I have kept since I was a boy. And Jesus looked at him and he loved him. And he said, there's one thing, one thing that you lack. Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then come, follow me. And at this, the man's face fell and he went away sad because he had great wealth. And so we thank God for his word this guy, the very last thing that we learn here, this guy had great wealth. If you read Matthew and Luke's account of this same story, uh, Matthew adds that this guy is young, he's healthy, he's kind of in the prime of his life. And when you read Luke's gospel, Luke adds that this guy is a ruler. And so that's where we get this, the story of the young, rich ruler and this is his story again seemingly has everything a guy could ever want but he runs in desperation mode falls on his knees before jesus what do i need to inherit eternal life and so we're going to unpack this with the time that we got left unpack this and so from this story we're going to see a problem this guy's got lots of problems wouldn't seem like it, right? His Instagram pictures and all social media says this guy's got it all going on. He's got everything. There's no problems at all, but this guy's got a mess of problems. And so there's a problem. Jesus will give a principle to live by, and then we'll close with a promise, a promise from God. So let's start with the problem. Again, guy's got lots of problems. One of the problems that he has is he's empty. He's empty. He's rich, but he's empty on the inside. He knows that something's missing. Some people have called that, that God-shaped hole or that God-shaped vacuum that, that people try to fill that up with all kinds of, 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 of things, but it just doesn't work because God's the only one that can fill up that God-shaped hole. But he, he understands that something is missing. And no amount of money, riches, possessions, pleasure, nothing is filling that up on the inside. He's got a problem. Now, I do believe that money can make you happy. I know you hear all the time, money can't make you happy, but you know that that's, money can make you happy. It just can for a little while. If you've got enough money, you can go on vacation. Vacation should make you happy, right? Everybody, you go on vacation, vacations make you happy. If you've got enough money, you can go out and buy a new car. A new car, yes, should make you happy. I right? heard a preacher say one time, fellas, if you've got enough money, you can even get the girl. Right? You can get the girl, her first name is going to be Gold, and her last name is going to be Digger. Right? And so, that's just watch out. But having money, right, can, you can have some fun, you can have some stuff, it can make you happy for a time, but as you know and as I know, what happens, <laughs> what happens when the vacation is over, right? what happens when the new car smell is gone, what happens when that gal that you got, uh, you know, uh, now your heart doesn't skip a beat anymore. What, what happens when you're back to your old empty self? What happens then? So, you know, money can make you happy for a while, but there's, there's something that money can't do. It can't give you that joy deep in your soul. Money can't give you that peace that passes all understanding in your heart. And money certainly can't give you the love um, that each and every one of us truly needs for our life. Um, and so, you know, only God can do that. Only God can fill that, 
that need for love and that hole. And so he, he's got a problem there. He also has got another problem. He thinks that somehow he can earn heaven. And that's easy to think in our world because we know that nothing's free, right? Nothing's free in this world. You, 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 you get some things because you, you got to work at it and you got to achieve and you got to, you got to do this to get rewarded. Some of you, you know, finishing up school, you're going to have awards programs. Maybe you already had awards programs. Uh, some of you on the dean's list, way to go. Uh, but, right, you, you achieve some things. In order to get those awards, you've got to do something. You put in the time, you put in the effort, you show up, you study, and you get rewarded for that. But what you need to know is heaven is not an accomplishment for you to go out and achieve and try to earn, Right? Heaven is a, it's a gift. It's a gift for you to receive. Jesus has already done all of that on the cross. Paid the penalty, paid your penalty, paid my penalty. That sacrifice is enough. Jesus is enough. And so it's up to you as a child of God to receive that into your life. And so this guy, again, got a problem. There's an empty spot. He thinks he can earn heaven. But he's got another problem here. He thinks he's good. He thinks he's moral. He thinks he's... He's okay, and so Jesus challenges him on this, and he says, okay, you think you're so good, let's see how you stack up against the Ten Commandments, right? And I just happened, if you happen to forget the Ten Commandments, I thought I'd throw those up on the board, maybe, possibly. Yeah, there they are. So, the Ten Commandments, and of course, you know, thou shalt have no other gods before me, you shall not make any idols. The first four of those commandments are all about how you're supposed to love God, and then the remaining six are how you're supposed to love your neighbor, other people. And so those are there. And Jesus says, okay, let's just see how you stack up against the Ten Commandments. There they are. Jesus knew. He knew that this guy was, was stumbling in some areas. And he knew that he had not kept all of those commandments. And so how about you? How are you doing with those? Are, are you following... Have you followed all of those your whole life, every day, forever and ever and ever? Amen? Right? We just don't. I could take commandment number five and get everybody. Right? Honor your mother and your father. I could get everybody on just number five. Because at some point in your life, you've disobeyed mom or dad. You've disobeyed somebody who told you to do something and you said, nope, I don't have time, right? Or I'll get to it when I want to get to it. After my video game, after I go out and do whatever I want, I'll get to it. Every time you were asked to do something and you rolled your eyes or you slammed your door, disobedience, right? Everybody, I can get everybody on just number five. But this guy thinks that he's okay. Romans 3.23 tells us different. says that all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God, right? And I'm not being mean about it or judgmental or nothing, but that's just what it is. We've all broken God's laws. And, um, and James 2.10 says... You know, if, if you broke one of those, if you just broke number five, you've really broken them all. He says, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. And so if you just broke one, you're still guilty of breaking them all. And unfortunately, the Bible says that you now deserve death, <laughs> separation from God, and this guy thinks that he's good. He says, Jesus, I've been keeping the law my whole life since I was like 13. I've been keeping the law all the time. And yet he's still wanting some assurance. There's still something that's missing. He knows that no amount of money, no amount of pleasure, no amount of good living can provide him that assurance that he's okay with God. It's interesting that Mark says that Jesus loves this guy, even though this guy's got lots of problems going on. He's just a mess. He's kind of all jacked up on his thinking, right? He's got some stuff way out of order. Jesus loves him. And what gets me about this is Jesus loves him enough 
to tell him the truth. And I think if you want to know if you really love somebody, I think you, you know when you love somebody enough that you can be honest with them, you can be upfront with them, you can tell them the truth, even if it's going to be painful for you or for them. That's how you know. And Jesus, it says in verse 21, Jesus looked at him and loved him. But he says, Feller, there's one thing that you lack. Okay? There's one thing that you lack. Go sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven and then come and follow me. And see, this, this guy's problem wasn't, it wasn't commandments 2 through 10. It was really the first commandment. That, that was his problem. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. His problem that was, was that money was far more important than God. Right, right, that's the bottom line that his money and his possessions was far more important than God. And so Jesus puts his finger right on the problem, and he says, this is what you're lacking. You love money more than God, and so you're lacking this, this trust in God, and you're lacking this surrender to him. And, and we know Jesus is not teaching that money is bad. He's just not, right? He's not teaching that because money is not, right? And, and I could spend... I could spend a lot of time, and I won't, and Reed says amen, but I could spend a lot of time, uh, another hour, just talking about all the wealthy people in God's Word. I mean, there people after people, just wealthy, had possessions, had just, just a, even Jesus' his, his friends, wealthy, wealthy enough to support him and take care of him and bring them into their home and, and the disciples. And so that's, you know, a lot of people. With, with influence and, and wealth and possessions, and they used it in just wonderful ways, godly ways, and God blessed them, and he helped them. God's not against money, right? God's not against money. Money can be good. The danger is when you make money God in your life. Money's a, money's a great servant, I've heard, just... A terrible master and so we don't let it master our lives and so what Jesus was really telling this guy was leave your little G God behind money and follow me right big G God and when you do that things will work out for you things will work out for you if you get that right your spiritual life is the most important part. Don't let money and things get in the way of that, even today, right? Inflation through the roof, everybody's talking about gas prices, we got a shortage of baby formula going on. Don't even look at the stock market because it's red, right? We got all of these things that can weigh you down, things that can consume you, consume your time, things that can really shake you to the core, but instead of that, Jesus would say, be anchored spiritually. Amen. Be anchored spiritually. Your spiritual wealth is far more important than your earthly wealth and with all the things that's going on. So don't allow those things to distract you from your spiritual life, right? Right here. I mean, in the family of God, don't let anything distract you and deter you from what God wants. This guy had earthly wealth, but he just didn't have any spiritual wealth. And again, nothing wrong with earthly wealth. Just got to keep it in perspective, right? Just got to keep it in perspective. And Jesus said, what would it profit a man if he'd gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? And so... In our story, as the guy's leaving, the Bible says that he was sad, that he was grieving. It's just almost like this guy's sick at his stomach over what Jesus had told him because he had told him to leave behind the things that he'd really put his whole trust in. Possessions, money, things. They were all a God to him, and so that's the problem. Jesus turns to the disciples and he gives them the principle to live by. 
Um, as we go on in that passage, 23, Jesus looked around and said to the disciples, I wonder as he's looking around if he's wondering, hey, who else is going to leave, right? After I just dropped all of that, does anybody else want to go? And so he said, says to the disciples how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were amazed at his words. And Jesus again said, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples, they, they were even more amazed. And they said to each other, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible. It's impossible with man, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And Jesus is just teaching the principle that's found all throughout the Bible, that you don't put all of your hope in stuff. <laughs> you don't put your hope in riches and, and possessions and things that are just temporary. They don't last, right? Having a whole bunch of money can, it just can't. It can mess with you. It can mess with your mind. It can make you greedy. I want to take all of that. I want to hoard it. I want to keep it to myself. Having a lot of money and, and possessions and things can, can make you feel self-sufficient. You know, I've earned this. I'm, I'm smart. I've, I've worked hard. I get up early, right? But, but we're reminded that, well, yeah, you're smart because God's given you a brain and, and you're able to get up and work because God's given you hands and feet to go and do that. And so Jesus gives them the principle here that all of those things, possessions and monies, all of it's just temporary. They don't last. And those things can make you greedy and cause all sorts of problems. And so the question for us is, okay, I don't want to go down that road, so how can I guard my heart against loving things and money and possessions more than God? You know, what can we do? And I, I, I can think of a couple things. A couple things to guard your heart against loving money more than God. One is gratitude. I talked a little bit about this in our Sunday school class this morning. <clears throat> gratitude. Learn that everything that you have is a gift from God, right? God is the one who gives it all. The scripture says every good and perfect gift comes from above God blesses, and, and all of our blessings and things that we have all come from God. John the Baptist said this in John chapter 3, verse 27. He says, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. And so everything that you have, it's because of God. And so we want to have hearts of gratitude Thank you, God. E even with food, right? We say the blessing and we thank God for food. It doesn't matter what food you have. It doesn't matter if you're opening up a can of Armour Vienna sausages, right? We like those, right? Or ramen noodles. That's what our college kids live on, right? Ramen noodles. Everybody, yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter. Thank God. Thank God for, <laughs> for those noodles able to sustain me. We thank God for that. Even if you go out and have a big old steak, right? Or your favorite food, catfish sandwich, potato salad. God, I thank you for what I have. Amen. If you're able to go on vacation this summer, doesn't matter where it's at. Maybe you're just going to take a trip to Holiday World. Or maybe you're going to go and you're going to spend two weeks on the beach. But somewhere along the line, if you're going to the beach and you're heading down I-75 or however you get there, stop somewhere along the, uh, along the road and just say, God, thank you. Amen. Thank you for allowing us to be able to do this. And if you have to pull the kids out of the car and say, hey, do you know why we get to do this? Right? Do you know? God's the reason that we get to do this. And so God provides. And so gratitude, a heart of gratitude. Thank you. Gratitude will keep us in check. And the second thing, real quick, is generosity. Jesus told this guy, hey, if something's got a hold on you and it's, it's surpassed God and it's got a hold of you, you need to get rid of it. 
All right, whatever that thing is that's got a hold of you, get rid of it. Jesus told the rich young ruler here, he said, it's for you, it's your, your, your possessions. He said, you need to get rid of those, sell them, give them to the poor, just do something, don't keep them, because this is the thing that you lack. Get rid of it. Be generous, be a giver, not a taker, right? Be a giver, not a taker. Learn generosity, that call to worship passage that Brother John read this morning. Take a look at that again. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 through 19. Paul was telling Timothy, Timothy to instruct the church, be generous, be givers. It will guard your heart against all kinds of things. And, so, and of course, we learn generosity. Maybe you learn generosity right here in the church. The first, you know, that, that's where you learn giving to be givers rather than takers. When, when you learned about tithing, right? You give 10% of what God has given you, you give it right back to God. And so we teach that to, to our young people as they come up and they, I mean, they filled up the bucket today with coins and dollars. We teach them to be givers and not takers. We don't want to be under the curse, right? You read Malachi in the Old Testament, we don't want to rob God. We don't want to be under a curse. We want blessings to flow. And so there's a principle in the Bible as you give, right? You've heard before, you can't outgive God. Go ahead and try. You can't outgive God. And of course, we don't give just to get something back. That's not it. We give out of joy, out of trust, out of thank you, God, for all that you've done for me. I get, I get to give a portion of that back. And I've heard all kinds of your stories, testimonies, Sunday nights. We've talked about how God has blessed you as you've been faithful giving and, and, and you just give and give and how God has met your needs financially and in other ways. I've heard stories from you. You talk about you go to the mailbox and there's a check in the mailbox and how God provides for you and you just don't understand how that happens. Your washer and dryer was supposed to go out 20 years ago, but it just keeps on running somehow, some way. And we don't understand how that works, but supernaturally, as a part of the kingdom of God, God's able to keep stuff working. <laughs> and God's able to bring blessings. And God's able to do stuff that we think, wow, I don't understand this, and I don't understand it either. I don't understand God's economy but I do know this, the principle that's in the Bible, and you know this too, as you give, and as you are generous, God blesses. And it's not always money-wise, it may be some other blessings, but that's a principle that we find. Spiritual riches matter so much more than earthly riches. And I will say this, here in our faith family, here at Hillham Church, you guys are a generous people, so just thank you. <laughs> thank you for your giving. Thank you for your generosity. The past couple of years haven't been easy on a lot of institutions, a lot of churches, a lot of businesses, a lot of nonprofits, right? There's, there's, been, there's been institutions that have just tanked and have really struggled financially, but Hillham Church, we have not participated in that, right? And I don't understand that. All I know is God has blessed you, Amen. okay? God has blessed this church, and somehow, some way, God's hand of covering and blessings has covered this church and has covered you and your family. And somehow, some way, God makes it possible to meet your needs and to meet the needs of the church. And so God's done that before, continues to do that, and I don't see any reason why God won't continue to bless. Amen? Amen. And so we, just, we sang the song, you know, the, the faithfulness of God. Right? Great is thy faithfulness, and God is true to his word, and he is faithful. Amen. And we've been blessed. And so that's the principle. Jesus closes with, that, with this promise 
Um, the, the disciples ask, you know, who, who can be saved? <laughs> who can be saved? Sounds like it's hard to get in heaven. And Jesus said it is hard. In fact, it's impossible with, with man. Impossible to do that, but not with God. All things are possible with God. And so when you put your trust in Jesus... When you invite Jesus to fill that empty spot in your life, make him leader of your life, confess to him, but yeah, I've broken, I've broken God's law, those commands, and so I need Jesus to make me right. And when you do that and confess that and invite Jesus to come into your midst, Jesus says, I can work with you. (laughs) I can work with that. I can save you. I can make it to where you get home. Jesus is the one where you can win at the end of the game. Right? That's the promise that he has. You close that verse out in 31, but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. God, I don't need all this stuff. What I need most is you. What I need most is you. Jesus closes that section and he says, those that follow me, right, those who follow God, you're going to receive blessings now in this time of your life, but you're also going to be blessed with heaven someday. Proverbs 11.4 says, wealth is worthless in the day of wrath. Right? It's just going to pass. You can't take it with you. But righteousness delivers from death. And so there's only one way to get there, and that is with Jesus. Jesus is the one who delivers. Spiritual wealth is forever and ever, and it just keeps on going. And so that question that I started out with, I'm going to end with. Um, Would you rather? Would you rather be winning in the first part of the game, in the first quarter, or would you rather be winning at the end of the game? And we say, at the end of the game, that's where we want to be. And Jesus is the one who will get us and see us through. He invites you to find all that he has to offer that money could never buy. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day. We thank you for every family that's represented here. We love you. We ask that you help us to just do the things that are pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We love you. Again, just have your way with the things that's going on in us, in our lives. Use us as just instruments in your hand to go out to make a difference, a positive impact in the lives of people around us. We love you, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.